Mwiriwe. Ndishime kubabona mwese. It's a pleasure to be back here with you at Youth Connect Africa. Um, in 2019, I remember being here, and now because I'm back, I feel like I can say to everybody else, Murakweza Neza Urwanda. So to the youth of Rwanda, Mumeze Fresh, Mumeze Bo, Jambo, Salibonani, Bonju, Salam Alekum, Makadi. I'm very honored to be here today, Your Excellency, Our Excellencies, distinguished guests. We have had a morning where we have heard from our honorable guests, right? The guests of honor. But now I think it's time that we open the floor so we can hear from who I think are the honored guests, which are the youth of Africa today. You who are here today who've flown in from different countries, different parts of the continent, it is now time for us to be able to engage with our leaders. Imagine being all the way here and not being able to speak and not being able to say anything. So now it gives me great pleasure to welcome our panel onto the stage and then to be able to open the floor to all of us so we can engage. I love arriving in Kigali because I'll tell you something. There's Africa, then there's Africa. When you come to Rwanda, you are in Africa, okay? When I landed last night, the lights that I could see from the aircraft, I mean, there's parts of Africa. Sadly, I was at Africa Oil Week in Cape Town last week, and sadly, there are still 600 million Africans that have no access to electricity, who can't switch on a light. So I'm telling you that the few of you who are privileged to be in this room today, who are part of the leaders, the change makers, and who are welcomed in this beautiful country that I call Africa, right? It is really nice to be here again. So welcome to everybody and let's now engage. It gives me pleasure to welcome our first panelist. Last time I was here, I remember you saying, we have heard if you want to go far, go together. If you want to go fast, go alone. But what of if we go far and fast together? Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the stage His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist, now, he has flown in from Kenya and he is the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. And sir, while I applaud the young delegation you brought, I'd like to just take a moment to further applaud the two women in your delegation. <laughs> ladies, if you could please rise so we see you again and give you a round of applause. The two ladies from Kenya who are part of this all-men delegation, we salute you. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the Deputy President, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya, His, His Excellency Rigati Kachagua. Our next panelist this morning gives me pride to introduce because he is from my motherland, Zimbabwe. Where is Zimbabwe in the house today, by the way? <laughs> he is the UNDP country representative, Mr. Maxwell Gomera. And let's give a round of applause for his mother, who has the patent for KYC, Know Your Customer, as far back as when she was selling tomatoes. Thank you. And last but in no means least, the Minister of Youth and Culture of Rwanda, Honorable Rosemary Mbabazi. Thank you, ma'am. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you are ready because I definitely am. I'll start with 
Your Excellency, President Kagame, to open our floor and to begin our conversation here this morning. Now, we are in a ever-changing global environment. Some might read the news and watch the news about the war in Ukraine and think that doesn't affect us. I'm in Africa, right? But there is a changing world order. And our question to you this morning is how can the youth position themselves, the African youth, smartly to be able to take advantage of what is happening in this global changing world today? Right. Um, first of all, the world order will change from time to time with or without us, with Africa and African youth or without. So we, we are left with really a simple and a very clear particular choice to make and something to do. Do we want to be part of what influences the change of the world order or not? For me, the answer again is clear. We not only want to do that, we actually must do it. Otherwise, I don't think it's a good story to tell that every time we are marginalized. In fact, when people talk about Africa being marginalized, there is nobody that marginalizes them as the Africans other than ourselves. Because that's a challenge we must confront. And if we decide to confront that, we shall make headways. So back to the very point, the world order keeps changing and uh, Africa will keep left behind, being left behind. So we must address these problems best even on the topical issues that were talked about here, the very reasons why there is this summit. The youth will be part of any process for our continent if, again, as said earlier, they are able to find their rightful place. But here, it, it is not just for them to find the rightful place for themselves, and, and when I'm saying the youth, I'm really talking about us as well. I'm talking about the continent. So there has to be also that enabling environment, which all was well said earlier by the previous speakers. So the interaction between the desire, the drive, the energy, the need of the youth to take their positions, their rightful positions, and do the best starting with themselves, but they are actually doing the best for the continent. And then the structures as we have them on our continent of governance, whatever exists in our society, in our politics, all being sensitive to the fact that that interaction between what one side does helps support the direction of the other side. So the youth, the political structures as we have them, coming together, allowing each other that space and interaction, will, one, strengthen us, but it will also strengthen us to be able to contribute to what leads to the change in the world order. The world order is being influenced by those who 
have something in their hands. They have the tools, they have the power, they have, uh, well, sometimes they even tell you, it doesn't matter for them, they are pursuing their interests. Then they talk about doing whatever they are doing based on their values. So you have to take a, a step back, uh, ourselves, meaning Africans, and say, don't we have interests? Are we really going to be people who have no interests? Or are we going to be people who are constantly referred to as having no values and must be driven by other people's values? I think Africa has had and has values. We have had values before anybody else, if you will, in this world. So again, it's up to us, it's just upon us to be able to do soul searching and look at each other in the eye and say there is a lot we can do individually, the youth, but for each other and cover the society of our continent. So we need to just move from these statements and the theories and go to the real life, the real thing. Well, the Africans, we need to show up. We need to uh, tap into uh, our resources and resourcefulness to be able to be part of what changes the world order. Thank you, Your Excellency. We do need to keep up. At the UN General Assembly, you talked about that um, we are now in a digital economy, especially as your message to young people, that we need to keep up with this. So I'll now direct my next question to Deputy President uh, Gachagua and ask you about um, the post-COVID economy. It's very easy for us to outline the the negative elements of the, the, the pandemic, right? The weaknesses and the threats, if we were to look at this as a marketing SWOT analysis. Um, but let's look at the opportunities and the strengths that we can look at. It's a similar question to the one that His Excellency Kagame has just answered, but to lead on to that in post-COVID, to cleverly position ourselves and not be victims of anything and not say we've been left behind or that we've lost two and a half years. But let's talk about that. You're in a country where your youth have done wonderful things for you. You're on the cusp of change. You're about to take over for the next couple of years. What more can we do to look at the strengths and the opportunities post-COVID? Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Admittedly, the world economy has taken a great hit from COVID-19, but all is not lost. We have tremendous opportunities, and more so for our young people. And uh, from where I sit, the digital economy is the way to go and our young people are the drivers of that economy. And more than ever before, there is a great opportunity because the digital experience, the internet, the ICT interventions has removed physical barriers across the world. You don't have to come to Rwanda physically to explore opportunities. From the comfort of your one small room somewhere with a smartphone, you can do business with people thousands and thousands of kilometers away. We must explore intellectual property. And that is the way to go, more so for our young people because in terms of assets, land, which used to be those years to be the greatest asset, especially in Africa, is no longer available. Our young people must invest in intellectual property 
I want to give an example in my country. We have a taxi called Uber. The young people who own that facility don't own a single car. And they don't own an office. They have just created a system. Using that system, they are able to pull as many cars belonging to different people, connect the owners of the cars, and those who want to use the cab system to go somewhere. And through the use of technology, money keeps on changing hands, and the company has grown to a very big level. I want to say that uh, in terms of financial markets across the world, there are very, many, many, many opportunities that our people across the world can continue to exploit. And as we move forward, we must also move away from the traditional way of agriculture and move away from rain-fed agriculture to irrigation because of the effects of climate change. So even as many countries are feeling the effects of the post-COVID challenges, there remains very, very many opportunities in the tech world, in finance, in international capital. And all we need to do is that with the advent of internet and the ICT options, we want to encourage our people across the globe to reach out conference like this one, a summit like this one, is a great opportunity for people to make inroads and get to know what opportunities exist outside their home countries. I'm sure, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, before the end of this summit, some of the young people here who are suave in business matters have already made some connections and they have a new opportunity. So the real, real opportunity of dealing with post-COVID challenges is using technology to reach out so that we can explore new opportunities outside the traditional um, available uh, opportunities that have been put down by COVID-19. And therefore, the world is big, the stage is large, all we need to do is continuously engage, and I'm sure that uh, with that engagement, having removed the physical barriers that people don't have to meet to explore opportunities, a lot of opportunities are available to help us put the world back to where it was before COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy President. I think that confirms the message that this generation resonates with, that technology helps you to work smart without necessarily having to work hard. Um, now we'd like to move on to Honorable Minister Babazi. Um, speaking of technology and opportunities, we have this amazing summit that this country has birthed. The question now is, after we have left and we've all flown back to our countries in a couple of days, and we wait for the next one next year. What happens in between? And how do we manage to maximize the vision and mission of this summit to truly transform the continent? Thank you very much, our moderator, and welcome back home. Um, the question you're asking is about the way forward. And um, I want to appreciate our leaders for being present and for the support throughout this journey, whether 10 years down the road, and also uh, five years of hosting Youth Connect. One of the main objectives was uh, in threefold, I would say, and that will inform the next steps um, post the summit. The first one is to influence policies. How, what kind of policies do we have by having this platform bring together partners and also the youth themselves to influence policies that uh, His Excellency, the Deputy President was talking about, taking their rightful place. It is about policies. What kind of policies do we have in our countries? And so the policies is a major element, besides being a document that we keep in a, 
in a fold and you keep it in a shelf, it is a policy that should be implemented and put into place. And those policies are youth-friendly policies that are putting them at the forefront of the uh, development agenda of our countries, but also having them participate fully. And having 30 countries, we follow up through the hub, the Youth Connect Africa hub, that is hosted in Rwanda, but coordinating 30 countries. We follow up and working with them what kind of policies and learn from each other. The best policy in the Republic of Kenya can be replicated in Rwanda, or the best policy in government of Rwanda that is implementing can be implemented in Zimbabwe, or Liberia, or any other African country where we are implementing and beyond. The second one is programs. Also, the policies influence programs that we have. And in these programs are youth-friendly programs, especially in skilling the young people with the relevant skills that they need. Also having opportunities for entrepreneurship skills and employability skills. But above all is the dialogue, the intergenerational dialogue. We have seen your excellencies, uh, your leaders, the leaders, your colleagues taking it up. After this meeting, when they go back, they organize intergenerational dialogue, which is a platform that bridges the leaders and the young people. And they listen from them and they understand and this dialogue helps them to influence the kind of policies. The third is to expand partners. We started in 2012 when we had only about four to five partners. Now we have more than 50 partners. And the same ecosystem that we have in Rwanda of the partners that we have that are influencing in the policy spheres of influence are the same that we are building at the country level. So the Youth Connect country chapter in a, in a country that has launched it, we create that kind of ecosystem and network that supports young people so that we avoid duplication and wasting resources, but instead we create linkages and we have more economies of efforts by producing and doing much more. So post the summit, we follow up. We have many young innovators that are here that are also got awards. We have Youth Fellow, Youth Connect Fellow, of like-minded young people, a network of more than 100 young people that are influencing and change makers in their community. But also different components of Youth Connect are implemented at the country level. So when we meet at the, uh, the summit, we listen from each other. What have you been doing? And what else can I do? So when they go back, they also implement. Thank you very much, Honourable Minister. So policies, programs and partners, like a triple P, you know. Um, Mr. Gomera, I'll come to you now. And uh, straight after that, I think it's important to talk about policies. Now, as UNDP, you go into all these countries and you do so much work there. But there is the issue of policies, that sometimes you go there with these ideas and as has been said, the dialogue happens. The youth are energized, they go back with passion. Um, Deputy President talked about taking our rightful places at the table. But remember, there are some policies in some countries that don't allow us to take our place. We still have to wait to be given a place. So let's talk about the work UNDP does and maybe some of the challenges that you face where policies, especially programs as well, affect the pr productivity and the progression of these kinds of think tanks and the, the ideas that come out of this. Thank you, Rubeneko. Before I get into that, I must say, uh, Your Excellencies, I'm inspired by your words today. I'm especially inspired, Your Excellency, by your view that Africa and Africans are no longer a people to whom things happen. We are no longer a people for whom things are done. My 23 months in this country have shown me that we are a people with whom things can be done. And our work with young people in this country has shown me that we are also a people who make things happen. So I'm very inspired by that. In terms of the policy work that we do, we are a partner. We as ourselves are not the government of Rwanda. We are a partner to the government of Rwanda. We are a partner to the people of Rwanda. Sometimes in their journeys to look at the world today and say, as you've said, there's a lot of trauma that's happening in the world. How do we make sense of it all? There's a cost of living crisis out there. 
There's a pandemic. There's everything. We are there to work with government, governments to think about how do we make sense of this? How do we deal with it? But not just thinking. We are also working with governments to show that we can do something about it. And we've worked, especially in this country, to look at areas where we can demonstrate that actually there's another way of looking at the world. We worked with the government of Kenya some years ago to look into Kenya's energy mix. And it was UNEP which worked with the government to do the first uh, gas well in, uh, in, in, in Kenya. And right now, if you look at uh, Kenya's energy mix, it's the pride of Africa. The United Nations was there to be a partner. But we also understand that just having a pilot there is not enough. We work with governments to take things to scale. We look for partners. We look for the African Development Bank over there. We look for youth. We look for everyone in this house, the education sector. I was talking to my brother from Africa Leadership University. We work with them to make sure that things get done. Thank you very much, Mr. Gomera. Thank you. So that has warmed up our stage, I hope, and I'm hoping that you're all ready to engage with our panelists this afternoon. And we'll take our first set of questions now. If you are ready, we are ready. I'm sure there's a roving microphone that will come to you. If you just raise your hand um, and we will be able to take your question. And for the purpose of everyone, just introduce yourself, right? Where you're from um, and, and what you represent here today. And then you can go ahead with your question. So let us open the floor, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends. The floor is yours. Okay, I see a series of hands. Just want to check that our microphone is ready. Okay, we can start um, in this corner here. Gentleman in the white. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Nanaji Maiprempe from Ghana, the CEO of Grow For Me. And uh, first of all, I want to commend Rwanda for conducting the first trade on AFTA, and I think it's a very exceptional achievement. However, I'd like to ask a specific question concerning agriculture and AFTA. What are governments doing to put agriculture at the forefront of AFTA, knowing that cross-border trade is already happening and we can see much more massive trade if agriculture becomes a critical component of AFTA? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what we can do is we can take our first round of questions, maybe three at a time, and then come back to the panel. I think maybe um, that might be a good way to do it. Um, our next hand, we can come here. Um, where's the microphone? Okay, all right, um, you may go ahead. Yeah. Where's the microphone? There you go. Okay. Uh, good morning, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am Abdul Karim Abdumaduku. I come from uh, a great and uh, wonderful country in West Africa. Uh, I come from Niger, and uh, I congratulate you for uh, the, this summit, this initiative. Uh, I will speak in my language, French. Uh, donc. Monsieur le Président, comme vous l'avez dit, nous sommes pas un pays, un continent de problèmes. Il est vrai que nous avons les crises sécuritaires au Sahel, dans le bassin du Congo. Nous avons connu Ebola, la Covid-19. Bref, il y a tous ces problèmes. Mais dans le même temps, on constate qu'on a de merveilleuses opportunités. Je, je vous invite tous à, à visiter la magnifique ville de d'Agadez, dans le nord du pays, de, de mon pays, ou bien le plateau de Gizeh en Égypte, nous avons ce magnifique pays des mille collines. Ils ont fait de, de cette géographie accidentée un atout dans l'Afrique du Sud. Et je conçois, je comprends que tout ça, c'est des belles opportunités pour nous permettre de créer de la richesse, de faire euh, une économie très forte. Mais ma question, c'est que généralement, lorsqu'on parle de tout cela, l'on oublie une partie importante des jeunes surtout les jeunes de loin les plus discriminés. Je parle principalement de trois catégories. Les jeunes femmes dans les zones rurales, 
Elles sont très souvent oubliées. Elles sont sous-représentées. Je parle aussi des personnes handicapées. Je suis l'une des rares personnes aveugles de mon pays à pouvoir étudier jusqu'au troisième cycle et à pouvoir être avec vous par là. Ici, la plupart de mes frères et sœurs, personnes handicapées d'Afrique, n'ont pas eu cette opportunité. Et troisième chose, je parle des minorités qui sont souvent également oubliées. Alors comment on fait dans le cadre de Youth Connect Comment on fait dans le cadre de nos politiques et programmes Madame la ministre, vous avez parlé de cela, pour que, oui, l'on parle des jeunes, mais qu'on parle de tous les jeunes. Tous les jeunes partout de l'Afrique, parce que nous ne voulons pas seulement changer l'Afrique. Nous sommes quand même le berceau de l'humanité, nous sommes le pays de toutes les valeurs, nous vo le continent de toutes les valeurs, et nous voulons changer carrément le monde, mais nous ne pouvons pas le faire si tout le monde n'est pas pris en compte. Comment on fait ça Merci. All right, thank you very much. We're going to take one more question from this side, then I'll come over to that side of the room. Um, lady with the colorful blouse, thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know this is a very useful room, so I want to just do something very quick. Viva Yus Viva! Viva Youth Viva! Viva! My name is Ruth K. Kangwandlovu, and I am coming from the beautiful country called Zambia. Over 60% of Africa's population is the vibrant youth between the ages of 15 to 35. Often we've been viewed as beneficiaries and the future leaders of tomorrow, and less of stakeholders or the partners now. My question, Your Excellencies, is how can we foster for intergenerational dialogue and a co-leadership which invests in the young people now to create synergies to bring forth the Africa we want? How can we begin to build trust between institutions and young people, as well as create shaped successes of our in Africa. I end off by bringing out a quote that Namibia's first lady, Ma'am Gengos, once said. She stated that the only logical way to manage generational transition is to intentionally groom suitable successes to ensure a smooth transition. So how can we foster for this dialogue and co-leadership? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll close that round now and uh, allow for our panel to respond. And I think we'll start with the first question. Um, President Kagame, maybe you can take this one, because again at the General Assembly, on this issue of agriculture that was asked um, by the, the gentleman, you talked about um, preventing cross-border taxes, for example, you know, and when you talked about the peace and stability even in um, the DRC. So maybe you can take on that one about agriculture and why there's so much emphasis on an agroeconomy as an African state. I think increasingly there is um, light being shed on uh, the importance of agriculture, uh, which in the past had been ignored, but for reasons you can't easily understand, because whatever we are doing here, whatever we are saying, agriculture is a source of what enables us to walk, to work, to do everything we do, because it's a source of food. We need that. So if anyone was imagining agriculture is not important, that was a big mistake. But I think every day there is a realization of, of that, its importance. But we have also been helped by the fact that agriculture has had visibility in terms of that not being a source of our livelihoods in terms of food, but also 
as a big sector of business. It's not just food that we eat or we go grow culture, uh, grow crops and we have different sources of what to eat, whether it is livestock, it is fisheries and so on and so forth. Now, then we have the land where we have to do agriculture. I don't think there is anything lacking in that, whether it is land or water or, in fact, we've been spoiled by having rains and sunshine and in a mix that enables our agriculture to thrive. And maybe that's why people took agriculture for granted in the past on our continent. But I think, as I said, we are w waking up to this fact that uh, we, we need to invest ourselves more into agriculture. Everything is available. It's a source of food. We need uh, uh, the food uh, systems have to develop, have to grow, that's, that's the future, that's uh, the world over. And then, as a source of business, we have seen how people can thrive on that. Now people are going to start producing or have been doing so for many years for export. If you People f can feed themselves and then be able to feed others through that uh, trade and business interaction. That is a great thing to do. And it ties in with the climate change issues, how we take care of uh, these challenges of uh, climate. In a nutshell, the world has come to wake up and therefore Africa has not been left behind. And I think we are seeing a momentum which we should encourage and, and therefore be able to do that. So the point of uh, DRC, what, did, what was it? It was just that when you, you talked about it briefly at the UN General Assembly, when we, because we're talking about the ease of access, right? And the way that we can, you know, do business between each other as countries. Yeah. For example, even taxes. Yeah. Um, you talked about the issue of Eastern DRC having to reduce their taxes because of the, the level of instability there is, you know? So those kind of hindrances on our continent, whether it's political, um, whatever the case might be, they are those challenges. Yeah. So it was just to highlight what you had mentioned, but I think you have answered the question, yeah. yeah. So, but that is anyway the whole thing. And now that we have uh, the African uh, continental free trade area yeah. Yeah. in place, yeah. I mean, really, we have to be dealing with the production, productivity, then we have the markets, and then the African continental free trade area is the biggest free trade area. Now it has become the biggest in the world. So all these are opportunities for us, for the young people, to now look at, switch their minds to something that initially had not been so important, but is more important now than almost anything else. And that is agriculture, and now the market through which we can uh, do any trade that is linking with agriculture or anything else is there for us to benefit from. Sure. So I don't see really the difficulty, and, and if the young people tune their mind the correct way and look at uh, all these opportunities available to us, which even touch our own lives, but also touch other people's lives elsewhere, and in between there is uh, a, a lot of uh, money to make. Mm. So what, what is it that they were waiting for? Right. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, we had a second question. I don't know, Honorable Mabazi, if you want to try and take that one um, from our brother who was speaking in French. Um, uh, we, we'd want to make sure that we address all the questions. Um, or maybe, Mr. Gomera, did you catch some of it? Um, okay, what we can do for now is we can look at the one that came last um, from the lady from Zambia, and we can look at how we can foster integrational dialogue, how young people can begin to put trust in institutions, and how uh, we can be looking forward to succession. How are today's leaders setting up young people for that? Um, so um, I'll come to you, Deputy President. Uh, thank you very much. That's a very good question and a, a very good insight. The young population constitutes 60% of the population, as she has rightly put it. This 60% can influence and have any decision made anywhere in the world. As I said in my address, it's upon our young people to take the lead and the initiative to assert themselves and influence policy. Policy is lobbied, it is influenced through advocacy and through lobbying. We want to encourage our young people not just sit as bystanders at home. And as I said, I want once more to encourage our young people to seek for opportunities to provide leadership. And most of these positions are elective. And with a 60% of the population, our young people have no excuse at all not to occupy any position they desire anywhere in the world. They have the numbers. It's simply for them to put their act together and decide what areas they want to have influence. And then have a very pragmatic engagement with their peers of that particular age and seek for those positions and applying the superiority of numerical advantage. Take over the positions and influence policy. And we need to lobby governments in Africa to create a regulatory framework that is friendly for young people who have no experience, who have no capital, to be able to get into the business world, to be able to be active participants of the economy. But that will be done through lobbying and influencing policy. But that cannot be done if our young people are not organized and are not determined. And I want to tell the participants in this conference, nobody will come for you at home and give you a position. You have to leave home and go and look for it. <laughs> and please, don't believe that story, that you are the leaders of tomorrow. No, why do you want to be the leaders of tomorrow? Be the leaders of today. Anybody above the age of 18 is an adult for every practical purpose. So why would somebody be telling you when you are 25 years that you are the leader of tomorrow? The, the young people between the age of 18 and 35 are the leaders of today. Please, please, let the people of President Kagame's generation and my generation not confuse you and cheat you that you are the leaders of tomorrow. <laughs> you have the energy, you have the brains, you have the creativity, you have the numbers, please, Put your, get your act together, and once more I ask you, take your rightful place in the decision-making table. I love it. Thank you so much. We are the leaders of today, not tomorrow, right? I believe we have some football legends in the house today.
Where are they? The football legends. This way? Please may you stand. I just heard. I mean, I don't know a lot about football, but I just heard. Um, wow. Okay. <laughs> so this is what you look like off the field, huh? All right. So from our legends, it would be nice to hear from... Wait, do you want to... You want to come onto the stage? All right. It would be nice to hear from one of you. That's nice. If we could, um, thank you. Very much. Thank you, thank you. My name is Anthony Baffo, and I'm from Ghana. <laughs> His Excellency, the President of Rwanda. His Excellency, the Vice President of Kenya. Honorable Minister representative of the UN, via youth, Youth Connect. I hear you. It's a great honor to be here. We just created a project which is called The Legends in Rwanda and to also create the Veterans uh, World Championship. But as you have seen, I'm not alone. I'm with Greater, better players, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I know you're good with your feet, but the way you're on the edge of that stage is making us so nervous. Are you scared? Yeah, please just come. come I should yeah, come to you? It. Right, come center stage. No problem. <laughs> so I'm at the center stage now. That's where I feel at home. I'm not alone. Let me introduce the other legends to you as well. We have African Cup winners. We have Olympic gold medal. We have a world champion as well amongst us. And let me start with him, Lillian Turam from France. Wow. And then we have Kalilu Fadiga from Senegal. Uh -huh. Then we have Patrick Magic Mboma from Cameroon. Please come on stage. Patrick, please, please may you all come on stage as you're please being called up. Please come on up. stage. Yes. <laughs> Here you see Kalilu Fadiga, Patrick Mboma, Lillian Turam, and then we have the man who is still very good with his waist, Mr. Roger Miller from Cameroon. <laughs> And then, we have a young gentleman. I'm not really happy with him, because in 2003, he won against Ghana, and they qualified for the African Cup 2004 in Tunisia. Jimmy Cadete. <laughs> nice. Yes, this is your own. But you see, when we play football, we always need a team behind the team. Yes. And someone also who leads us. And there's a young gentleman. We are here at Youth Connect, and you see we are all young. And um, this gentleman is called Fred Seaware. He had the vision with the veteran championship, world championship. His Excellency, on behalf of the legends, we want to thank you for receiving us in this wonderful, beautiful country of Rwanda, who is also like the, has been now like the open gate to Africa. We are very happy to share our experience with you, the youth here, and we don't want you to give up. If somebody rejects you, go and knock again on his door. Mm. If you see all of us standing here, we also came from somewhere. Some didn't even believe that we are going to make our careers, but now we are here and we have made our careers. We want to encourage you, the youth, to never give up the fight. And one word. I'll give you to go home with after this Youth Connect. There's no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs.
Thank you, Youth Connect. Thank you, Africa. And uh, we don't want to forget one person, sorry. In football, you see you have federations. And they are led by presidents of the federation. So we have the president of the Rwandan Ferrafa Federation, Monsieur Olivier, a very young man. Okay, yeah. And uh, Honorable Minister of Sports, thank you for being a great host to us. Also, former sports lady, thank you. Thank you to our football legends. Give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. So I'm sure you can see how the young people respond to sport, and you should have seen them earlier about how they respond to music. Just listen to this. Let me see you. Whoa, la, la, la. Thank you very much. You may take your seats. It's a pleasure and it's an honor. Thank you for joining us here today. There are very few things that bring us together sometimes when we're surrounded by differences, and football definitely is one of them, and of course, music. So thank you very much for that interlude. And now we're going to continue with our question and answer session, um, and we're going to take our last round of questions so that we can close off our session this morning. Um, so I'm gonna to come to the other side of the room that I haven't visited. Um, we can start on this side, okay, yes, the lady here in the brown dress. Can we get the microphone here, please? <laughs> and then uh, the gentleman in the front, please. And then, this is so difficult, this is my worst part. <laughs> um, uh, I'm looking for a lady now because we heard so much from the men. The lady there in the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, so in that order, please go ahead with your questions, thank you. Thank you so much for giving the floor. His Excellency, the President of uh, Rwanda, uh, honorable guests, honorable, um, does not work. I would like to start with thanking you very much from the deepest heart for the very inspiring speeches that you have given. My name is uh, Tsik Tsik. I am from Madagascar, and Tsik Tsik is a word that means smile. Because we in Madagascar, we love happiness. As you can see with the delegation here, we are all smiling because we like happiness in Madagascar. I would like to ask you and would really appreciate answers from you, honorable speakers. It's not working. Very sorry. Thank you so much for your assistance. I would like to ask three questions. Very, very short questions, but very clear too. The first thing that I have remarked in all the speeches, all the things that people have said, that there is a very big optimism and positive thing in all the speakers when they are taking the floor. And I would like to ask you, how did you inspire how did you insert that in the identity of the population? How can we also have that optimism, that positive mind? If you could share with us some keys, we would really appreciate. The second thing is His Excellency, the President, you have always talked, always talked about discipline. How? Please. If you don't mind sharing with us, how could you do, how could you manage setting up discipline in Rwanda? That's one thing, but also keeping it. What's the secret? And last, I would really appreciate too if you could answer for us youth. We have the strength, we have dynamism, we have zeal, we have many things, but People usually say that youth lack of experience. So is there a shortcut to get experience very quickly for the generations that have already reached experience? Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, our second hand was the gentleman in the blue suit um, up front here with the bow tie. Hello, hello everyone. 
my name is Ulrich. I'm 24 years old, Norwegian, and here representing the European Business Chamber of Rwanda. When I came here two months ago, for, uh, for four weeks ago, pretty shocked, I went to the city of Bigogwe. Now in Bigogwe, I met people that every day rely on crops such as bananas and beans in order for them to live. What I saw was that if these crops doesn't grow tomorrow, there'll be no tomorrow. My president goes to His Excellency, Mr. President, Paul Kagame. When I was there, I saw something that I'd never seen before. People more happy than I ever seen traveling across over 50 countries in the world. I saw a unique type of happiness. And, and what I would like to know is how do you increase the number of money coming into this country while still keeping us the happiness of these people? Because what I realized after that is that money doesn't buy happiness. Is, is there one place in the world that has happiness? It's Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And our last question over this side of the room, please. Is there another microphone this side? Yes, thank you very much. Greetings from Sierra Leone, the beautiful land of diamond, bauxite, and gold. I am Mayatu Estekaba. I'm a radio mentor working with the BBC Media Action. I'm a youth and uh, SDGs ambassador working closely with the Ministry of Youth, UNDP, and Vionet. Hearing from our African leaders seated at that stage, you know, gives me so much hope about the future of my continent. I'm so impressed about the great work they are doing towards the empowerment of young people. Um, Madam Minister, you mentioned um, your strive as a ministry and as a country in improving the lives of young people um, through using the three P's, um, which are policies, programs, and partnership. I would like to know, in all of this, um, is there anything like localized investment for youth, for young people? If so, what does it mean within the context of Rwanda? And what can you say are the best practices to decolonize or deconstruct empowerment for young people across Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so to close that round, I'm just going to pick it up from um, the question that we had uh, from the gentleman who spoke and asked his question in French in the previous round. What he was asking, was how is government, how are policies going to assist the marginalized, for example, those living with disabilities, in particularly rural communities in Africa? Um, that was his question. So we can start with that one. Um, I think I'll give that one to the deputy president, and then we can move on to this next round of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question of marginalized groups and communities is a challenge across the world. And it all depends on the attitude of the leadership of one society or another. In my home country, Kenya, we have a deliberate policy on people living with disabilities. We have made procurement laws of access to business and put aside 30% of all businesses that are procured in Kenya for the youth, women, and people living with a disability. So anytime there is a tender, 30% of business is set aside for youth, women, and people living with a disability. And that has been a very successful empowerment program 
for those particular groups that have been marginalized there before. Again, I want to repeat, policies are influenced through advocacy and lobbying. Where in your country there is marginalization, say for example, of people living with disabilities, our young people who have taken over the digital space shout about it, raise the issues, continuously lobby to influence governments to create laws and regulations that creates an equitable and just society where all people, irrespective of the various challenges they may be uh, having, are treated equally like other people in that particular country. So I think that is something that we ask you as young people because of your unique advantage in controlling the digital space is a very serious tool of influence. Use it positively and effectively to fight for equity and justice for human beings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, Your Excellency, President Kagame, a number of the questions were targeted at you. Um, so we'll start with the first one um, from Tsikitsik from Madagascar, the smiling lady. Um, and I'll speak to it in parts because she asked three different questions. So I think I can go with it, uh, go through it with you. Um, but the first one is really more of an inspirational one, right? She says that you sp all stand up here and you speak so positively, so optimistically. Where does that light come from? And I think this is really about mindset, right? Um, and and how, how much young people also need inspiration above anything. Um, and then the second part was about discipline. Right? Um, in particular, yourself as a leader, what is the secret? How have you managed to instill discipline? And then the third is, is the youth's lack of experience a hindrance? Is that our Achilles heel? Um, you know, how do we still get a seat at the table? Wow, this, this is a very loaded question, yes. but... Uh, <laughs> you know, um, at a personal level, I, I, it isn't so much that uh, I, few things one could accept to take credit for, but many more things seem to happen by luck. But I'm not asking anybody to pursue luck. So sometimes luck also pursues people who are doing things that, uh, and then they, they are lucky. But given my background, with so much I have gone through at a personal level from the time I was young, maybe from 20 years of age. Uh, some of the things shape you, they shape your thinking, they, um, and, but there is a saying which was not coined by me, but by many other people, uh, of uh, saying to walk the talk. What is walking the talk? Walking the talk, I think people are saying, do or practice what you say. Uh, so, People have to make a choice. We, 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 we get to hear from people, we learn, we read books, we do all kinds of things. There's a lot of learning through that. In you as a person, you may decide, you make a choice. What person do you want to be? What society do you want to be part of, and you make a choice how you play part in that. You must play part in what you become. You must play part in what the environment around you becomes 
Even if you make a small contribution, that will be fine. But you must shape something about you, about your environment. So these are the choices you make, um, I guess, at every level, every person makes that choice. Or you fail to make that choice, and of course with the consequences. <laughs> Things happen to you personally when you've made the wrong choice or you have, when you have made no choice at all and just sit back and wait for things to impact you. So the question, therefore, the complex of the question she was asking is both, I think, put it at a personal level, but also at a societal level. And uh, so once you've made that choice personally, and that can apply to anyone and everyone here, then how do you interact with the environment to the point that you learn from what impacts you, but you also learn to impact your environment. So there is an interaction. And, and, and so the discipline I was talking about, therefore, originates from that kind of thinking being conscious of your choices and what you want to be and what, and also the choice of the society that you want to become part of. So that, that has to do with discipline. There is that discipline of mind of going through this process of making the choices, how you are impacted, what you want to be, but also and that's how it leads to what the deputy president uh, repeated so many times, and it is, it is actually very important. It's how do you step forward and not wait for, you know, that's how people wait for handouts. <laughs> if, if you wait for a handout, then that's, uh, in the end, that's what you become. But if you step out and go and do things and ask and insist and, you know, so if you go into politics, like they're saying from 18 to 25, you, 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 are, you are through a process of making a choice, personal, but also beyond you. So, the environment where you are. And that's how people become MPs, members of parliament. Uh, and, and I'm singling this out to say, again, to answer the question of experience. Experience means a broad range of things. Experience in what? Experience is not just a question of time or age. It's also what you are doing in that time. For example, I'm older than uh, the deputy president, I think by far. But you may find he, he would do a better job, or he knows a lot more about interacting with, say, society because he became an MP, a member of parliament. A member of parliament deals with the people on a daily basis on so, for so many reasons. You, you, you get to understand their, what their needs are, then later on you want to go back to, for their votes, uh, and that explains, therefore, what has been happening between you and them. That is a rich experience you get over time in that particular job that I may not have even when I'm older, because I've never become a member of parliament myself. I, I was brought up in completely in a different environment 
which even though it put me close to people, ordinary people to work with, it wasn't to that extent a member of parliament does. Uh, so uh, for me, the environment was completely different. Uh, so you might assume therefore that because I'm older, I have more experience, but that's not necessarily true. I may have more experience in a different dimension, but in dealing with these people and understanding their needs and daily, you know, sharing everything on a daily basis as members of parliament do, I don't have that experience. Somebody younger, much younger than me, may have experience. So let people not get confused with this issue of experience. Experience comes with what, with the time, but with what you are doing. Yes, so young people can be seen to have experience, even with, uh, let's say, in our cabinet. Uh, and experience background shouldn't be a hindrance. You know, f for me, I was thrust into government. I didn't know anything about government. And it was like being thrown in a swimming pool when you don't know how to swim and you've got to, you know, to learn very fast so that you save your life. So that's, that's, that's the kind of thing. So, but that is showing you that experience should not be an impediment. It shouldn't be. The impediment comes when you have not been having this process of thinking and making choices about who you want to become, about what you want others to be with you, all right? So, and a que again, a, a question of uh, happiness is also a choice. Uh, happiness comes from uh, the wish to be happy, but also the understanding of your own situation. And, and if you are working towards a good situation that affects you, and uh, driven by the incentive of being happy, then you become happy. You, and, and, and it doesn't mean that you only become happy when you don't have problems. No, you can actually be happy when you have problems. Only that, <laughs> only that it depends on how you understand your problems and you are able to put them where they belong as you work on solutions. And in between uh, being happy is the energy that actually uh, bridges this gap between problems and solutions. So you make the choice. Yeah. Youth Connect Unauliza, you can be happy even if you have problems, right? Um, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you personalized it because I was going to follow up and say I'm sure even when you entered um, politics when you became a leader, you didn't have experience. And I think what we need to highlight is that we're in a generation where there isn't enough, there's not that much room also to make mistakes. Everything we do is recorded. I'm sure if we went back to your life 30, 40 years ago, there's so much that's just lost and gone because there was no one with a camera watching every move and recording everything. So when we talk of the need for experience, it's also because we are afraid to make mistakes because we'll be reminded of them tomorrow, the next day, and the internet these days never forgets. Um, but we can come to our next question, and while you're still on the microphone, um, Your Excellency, about how to, re how to um, have investment in Rwanda, right? Um, I think that was really what she was asking. It was quite a bit, but reinvesting in Rwanda, but also how do we encourage investment into this country? Encouraging, encouraging investments. Yeah. Uh, one, any country, anybody can work on encouraging investments. Sorry, to localize especially the investment, particularly. 
Okay, uh, to yes. localize the investment. Investment, yes, within okay. Rwanda. Yeah. Okay. For example, the young people we have around. In fact, we have um, created the systems uh, like at every, from the village level upwards to the district to the provinces. We have identified what is possible around in our country. We have identified the young people with the different backgrounds and have always carried the message of encouraging them to come forward to try and do things in the way of entrepreneurship. But alongside that, we have created a fund, a fund that is also decentralized to those levels uh, and tied with business in fact, the private sector, which I'm sure is represented here or present here, accompanies those structures. Uh, there's something called Business Development Fund, which we created. It is to target the private people, the young people who have ideas, who want to develop uh, those ideas, but if what is, the, what is they are lacking is money, there is a bit of money that through those structures that can be provided. At the same time, the private sector accompanies them because maybe somebody has a business idea up to a point. So in the system, there are people who accompany these new entrants into business or who have business ideas to develop them beyond maybe what they thought they should be able to reach. So that, that is how, therefore, one, business development takes place. Secondly, the investments, the map, the whole map is clear to everyone. And not only the, the will, encourage the local people to make those investments, it is later on what forms the foundation that attracts the foreign investments. Thank you very much. Okay, so now um, we're going to have um, our closing remarks, um, and then after that, I'm going to do something um, which I'm sure we will all appreciate. Um, but uh, I'll start with um, uh, you, um, Max, if that's okay, um, and get you to give your closing uh, remarks. And also, I guess you can also speak to the comments from the gentleman with uh, the 24-year-old gentleman, and also just give a summary of the questions that have come today, um, and also just going forward. And your position is UNDP, and we can give us your parting shot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You know, my first love affair with football started when I was watching uh, Roger Miller mesmerize everybody at the World Cup. And since then, I've not stopped falling in love with football. What he did show us and what the gentleman uh, who came up to the stage showed us that was that in whatever field of apples and oranges that any one of you is playing, if you do it well, first you add to the stock of dignity for every African. Second, you add to the optimism that every African should have. Third, you're doing a good thing for yourself as a person. So you're not doing some charity. And we were told today that actually being successful, you need to go through the staircase, not the lift. And that is important. So two things that I took from the discussion today in terms of how we go up those staircases. First, we are all at the table. What we do need are young people who are asking extraordinary questions of what they see around them. The world is not the status quo. It is not an inevitable eventuality of physics that we are where we find ourselves to be. We can change it, but we need to ask the questions. Mm. 
it was a young Isaac Newton at 23 who asked the question, why does the apple fall this way to the ground and not up to the sky? And that changed everything that the world works upon. So ask extraordinary questions. The second thing is be kind and have humanity. This is something that we are running short of in the world, kindness and humanity. Whenever we are hiring people at UNDP or at everywhere else, we take it as a given that people are technically skilled because the fact that you are applying for a job, you must be saying, I have the skills. What we do look at in young people is, do you have the kindness and humanity to be part of a team that is trying to change this world? Mm -hmm. And that is very, very important to us. And at UNDP, we are proud to be a partner with your government, your excellency, and uh, with everybody in this room, the private sector, in changing the lives of everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Gomera. UNDP country representative, thank you for that. Um, Honorable Mabazi, if you could also give us your parting shot. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, our leaders have responded to most of the questions, uh, but my parting words is uh, uh, when the young people are asking about the, the kind of attitude or the trust that the community should have, I just want to say uh, trust is earned. You have to earn the trust within the community. And also, talking about experience, it doesn't require only to be working in a recognized, known, uh, registered organization. Within your communities, you can do a lot. We have many young volunteers in Rwanda that had no the kind of experience that they would define, and they supported us during COVID-19 pandemic. So they went from house to house and teaching people how to uh, comprehend or respect COVID measures. And they are contributing factor that we had um, lesser uh, deaths probably or conti the contagious disease. So you can do anything within your community without waiting until you have a position. So influence is not only a position, it is an attitude, it's a choice that you make. So they can do a lot within their communities and you have seen it. The last one is about the mindset, the choice uh, to be happy. I think you can make a choice to be happy or not. And as His Excellency the President mentioned, I don't want to emphasize it more, uh, that you can be happy even within problems, but with uh, a choice or an attitude that you get out of those problems, they will not be there forever. So young people, the, the world is waiting to see what you have and what you can deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy President, please give us your final words for us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I've had about three things that have made my day. Money does not buy happiness. I can't agree more. Money is only good in what it can make you achieve. But it's not an aid in itself. Happiness is an attitude of mind. It's what you want. I agree with President Kagame that it's possible to be happy when you have problems. President William Ruto and I, as we looked for the presidents, had many problems, but we were smiling every day. It is possible, in spite of the challenges of life, because life is challenging, that you can still remain sane and be a happy person and never let problems bring you down because if you're down you'll never get up the football legend here has given me something to work on that there is no elevator for success you have to do the staircase that tells us you have to put hard work and there is no shortcut to hard work and finally, young people, please focus. The years when you are young are your best opportunity to be what you want to be in life. These are your best years. And if you get it right when you are young, the future is very rewarding. Take full advantage of your youthfulness, of your energy, of your vigor, 
of your passion, of your agility, of the opportunity to move around, mingle with other people, and please make the best out of the situation you are in of being youthful and energetic. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I would like now to read a quote to you. Dear optimist, pessimist, and realist, whilst you guys were busy arguing about the glass of water, I drank it. Sincerely, optimist. So this is to us to be optimistic and to always take the, uh, sorry, sincerely opportunist, sorry. We're supposed to take opportunities, right? That letter was signed by the opportunist. So in the age of opportunity, with the small power vested in me this afternoon at Youth Connect, I have two faces that I absolutely need to indulge. So Your Excellency, um, we just want to ask you if you don't mind taking just two more questions um, and then we can close off because I just feel like if I don't give them the chance to speak, I, this day won't end well. Um, so there's a gentleman here in the front and there's a lady who was screaming her lungs out with the denim jacket. Um, if we could just close off with that. Thank you. Je viens de la République du Tchad et toute cette délégation, il y a aussi euh, une partie qui est là-bas. Je voudrais avant tout euh, exprimer toute ma gratitude et mon hommage à son Excellence Paul Kagame, un président qui nous inspire tous. Je m'en vais poser une question directement à lui. Parce que je suis un passionné de l'Union africaine. Je suis un passionné de l'intégration africaine. Donc il est aussi l'un des moteurs, la question de l'intégration. Le Rwanda est, excusez-moi, est le berceau de la zone de libre échange continentale. D'où j'ai effectué mes études de recherche sur la ZLECAF. Monsieur le Président, la ZLECAF est aujourd'hui le plus grand espace d'échange commercial au monde. Il regroupe un certain nombre de pays géographiquement délimités. Ma question est de savoir, s'agissant de cette opportunité que Dieu a donnée pour l'Afrique, quelle est la dividende ou bien la possibilité que la jeunesse africaine, surtout les entrepreneurs, les jeunes entrepreneurs, peuvent en tirer profit de ce libre échange commercial dans cette zone. Ma question est adressée directement à son Excellence, M. Paul Kagame. Merci beaucoup. I think you can get straight into that one, sir, if that's okay. Thank you. First of all, indeed, it is an opportunity that Africa has arrived at a point where the countries can come together to create this vast uh, free trade area. The next step is to make it work and work the best way it should. There are many other things that uh, accompany such a thinking of making uh, a free trade area like that one. You, you, you must allow people to move freely as well. And that's why many African countries have been working on uh, uh, easing on different visa requirements or work permits or things like that to allow the Africans to be able to move and work freely in this space. The Africans are working hard at it and it is the right thing. So that's an opportunity, huge, huge opportunity for Africa. But all along we have been discussing the asset that the youth are to our continent. We've talked about policies 
that will make it easy once they have made their own choices to, for them develop themselves, do business, work, and, and so on and so forth. So for us, the only thing is to encourage that continued forward movement on the free trade area, even expand it more, ever reduce, continue to reduce on the obstacles that impede the kind of freedoms that people have uh, to enjoy in, in working in this uh, vast space. And, and, and then the education, the mentorship, the preparation of the young people to play uh, into this space and to be able to tap into the opportunity it provides uh, is also uh, our responsibility. It may be a challenge, but it is a responsibility above all that we have to exercise, as well as the young people, you know, using or based on many examples and uh, ideas that people have mentioned to us here. Uh, so the, the, the young people have uh, a task to, to be present, to move forward, to do what it takes even for themselves, for these uh, opportunities to benefit them. Thank you very much, sir. And now our last question um, from the young lady. Um, please go ahead. Oh, I remember you also from your dance moves earlier. Yes, I do. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, good afternoon to our excellencies. The president of um, Rwanda, Mr. Paul, um, our deputy president from our lovely country, Kenya, Mr. Rigadi, the Minister of Tourism here in Rwanda, and the UNDP representative, together with everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Ramina Paulette. I am a 16-year-old climate activist and an environmentalist from Kenya. And I am an environmentalist from Kenya. Yesterday, we were invited, many youths were invited by the UNDP for the Youth Connect Climate Summit. We even made a proposition a statement for the youths towards climate action. Rwanda has become a green hub in Africa. How can this model be replicated in most of the African countries, making sure in the process we create jobs for youth? This is a question for you, our pre the president of Rwanda. Now going back to our own deputy president, Mr. Rigadi from Kenya, with the new presidency, what is your take on the representation of youths and children in such conferences, like uh, this Youth Connect Climate Summit and even the ones that are organized in Kenya? For the climate finance, there has not been more transparency on where these climate finance are being delivered. They're not being accessible to many people, most especially from the local grassroots. For me, I am taking the lead towards climate action by advocating for the restoration of Lake Victoria through doing cleanups, using uh, water hyacinth to make products such as this, that creates a livelihood for women and youths in Kenya. Another question that I have, it's now for all the African leaders present at this room. You're going to be part of the climate negotiations, but it's time for us to style up and to advocate for loss and damage finance. For Africans, we have been on the front line of the climate crisis. When it comes to the media, the global media, Africans are not being taken seriously. Our things that are not being covered, like we had floods in Sudan, in Sierra Leone, it's not being covered. For the negotiations, we are not being taken seriously. It's time for us to make this change. And it starts by you, because our voices can only be heard by you and not by any other person. We depend on you. Yeah. 
I'd like to um, take a climate clock to you, uh, together with uh, Ina Maria from Namibia. Yeah? I'm taking to the MC. What's happening? What is this, your countdown? This is the climate clock. The climate clock, all right, thank you. Okay, so the climate clock reads six years, 282 days, three hours, 10 minutes, and 49 seconds. Okay. So this is for the loss and damage. We still have this year so that we can, we can take part in the climate reparations and advocate for uh, the climate solutions to be taken seriously. Thank wow. you so much. Woo! Young lady, you are phenomenal. You're 16, shouldn't you be writing your O-levels or something? I mean, you're amazing. And um, if I had not given her that opportunity, can you imagine the relationship between me and God right now? Um, but thank you for that. Um, I will hand over now to your excellencies. I, 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 I consider this more of a statement that was being Absolutely. made to us. Absolutely. Rather than the question. Yeah. Uh, so we will take, we will treat it like a statement, a right. statement emphasizing certain things that need to be done. Come the climate change conference coming, or issues to emphasize, and so on and so forth. I, I don't think really there is any question to answer other than reassuring her. Well, first of all, I'm glad she realizes that this is not uh, just an easy process or an easy thing for which you find a solution in, a, in one day. It, 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 however, we have listened to what uh, she has said, and uh, so many like her have said these things very loud and clear in different places, whether in New York at the UN General Assembly or different capitals of developed countries. And it's important that these statements, these voices continue to be heard. So it is on our duty, however, in, in, when it comes to us in these interactions, in these meetings, in these conferences, to be able to articulate our positions taking into consideration those uh, points that she has raised, whether it is uh, the climate financing or different activities that uh, uh, people think uh, are unfair or result into uh, the kind of injustice that has been so much pronounced. We can only say we, 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 we have listened and uh, we have heard these uh, messages uh, before. We understand their importance, yeah. and we shall also try to play our part among so many other actors that are out there. Thank you, sir. I think that's enough for the acknowledgement and the recognition of that and the commitment that you've been heard, right? Thank you so much. I mean, you came with a whole presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>